My journey begins right here in Zimbabwe, just after independence and in the early days of Zimbabwe and Africa freeing and finding itself. Everything was coming in and we were learning, well, that's not meant to go that way. Everything was coming in and we were learning how to be part of the world under new terms. Of course, I myself didn't know this, I was young, but my journey of the same began around about that time when I was 11 years old. That's me. Young, impressionable, handsome. <laughs> but if you could tell by the big eyes and that scar right below the left eye, I was the most well-behaved kid on the face of the planet. 4 p.m. cartoons were my lifeblood, my greatest influence. And thanks to local TV and my two half-American best friends, all I wanted to do was what I saw on TV. I wanted to create what was there, and in my other love, comic books. Things such as Sonic the Hedgehog, DuckTales, Samurai Pizza Cat, Spiral Zone, and many others became the bedrock of my first... You know these ones, yeah? They became the bedrock of my first series, Bio Bunny. Half robot, half bunny, all awesome. And just after that, I got a bit competitive with my friend in grade seven, and I created my all-time favorite, Captain Wolf, the superhero dog. Now, please forgive my naming conventions. I was a kid. And all I wanted to do was make awesome. You see, robots were cool. Dogs were cool. <laughs> Cars were cool, jets were cool, jet packs were even cooler. It's all I wanted to do. So it was then that I realized I wanted to grow up to become a comic book artist. I was also creating the world I wanted to be in, along with the world that I lived in currently. My young eyes had done what all young eyes do, and that is absorb without restraint. They betrayed the world I lived in, as well as the growing identity crisis I'm experiencing within myself. So I'll get back to Captain Wolf later. Fast forward to high school and I got, well, I did a lot more work. <laughs> and I got even more handsome. <laughs> I started wearing my cap backwards because it was cool. My mom still loved me though, but my friends loved Captain Wolf. I realized that I, I, I couldn't imagine myself becoming world famous for a dog called Wolf. So I shortened it to CW, edgier, cooler. I was getting into other things like X-Men, Fantastic Four, The Avengers and all those. So I wanted to create a team of my own. By now, I believe that the best stories were the ones that you lived, the ones from your own experiences. So, I went on to work and create a team of my own. I chose to tell the story of a group of teenagers, because I'd never been an adult. And I sat in a post-apocalyptic present where the entire adult population had been wiped out, leaving super-powered kids. <laughs> Convenient, yes. <laughs> By now, I was putting a piece of myself in all my characters, particularly the main character. They were really a reflection of myself, who I was, my own identity. And this story was no exception. It was called Titan Core, and the leader of the team was Isogen, a.k.a. Brent Angson. <laughs> he was a young boy, average height, fair skin, blue eyes, straight black hair and a long curl right down the front, reminiscent of another well-known superhero with a single black curl in his hair. <laughs> he was one of my heroes, I won't deny it. The rest of the team was no different. This is me, but this is who I created. So the team consisted of eight characters, only two of whom were black. They had adventures far away in America and Europe. Later, I would wonder why, when given the opportunity to tell any fantasy story, a young boy in Africa would choose to tell the story of a white kid in New York. Yeah, problems. <laughs> Either way, the story was popular. 
it obeyed the rules of cool. My friends did not notice the inherent identity issues. In fact, they liked it that way. Up until then, we did not know any well-known, hyper-popular superheroes that were black, even in science fiction. Fantasy was no better, and don't even get me started on video games. Until Michael Jackson, I didn't know a black character could be the lead of a video game. You see, until then, it was hard to even conceive of a black superhero, even for me. Either way, the feedback I got was fantastic, and I went on to first publish <laughs> Titan Core as my first ever released comic book. I spoke to my dad and convinced him to give me a bit of cash. I went to the local copy shop, and he helped make a whole bunch of black and white photocopies. He then spoke to my aunt who owned a pharmacy, and she graciously stocked my comic book. It left the shelves, and it told me that I had what it takes. Either way, the situation did remind me of what I already knew, that the rules of cool were other. They didn't come from me, and they didn't come from my land. In fact, they were imported like everything else. Yeah, they don't cry. It's not that sad <laughs> a story. See, they were coming from a media that was systemically biased. All the comics I had read had come from the West. I enjoyed them, I loved them, and I understood why the majority of their characters were white. I even understood why when they would imagine a galaxy far, far away, most of the characters there were also white. It's the world they lived in. It's what they statistically saw around them. It, was, it made sense that when they were asked to draw people, they would reach for a certain group of colors within the crayon box. What wasn't okay was that I myself, who had lived a vastly different life, when asked to draw people, would draw them and would draw myself as them. It's a bit of a problem there too. Now, before people assume that I'm blaming, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just pointing out what I consider to be sort of an unintended consequence of a globally pervasive single narrative. You see, the X-Men or the Avengers being majority white is kind of okay when you consider where they were being sold and who they were being sold to. It could even be considered not so harmful and not carrying much subtext. But when given to another audience in another location, it gains heavy subtext. That subtext is that they are less like me in the entire universe than they are of anyone else. That subtext is that my kind are rarely ever leaders or achievers. The subtext is that when my land is shown, we are rarely doing the saving. We're always being saved. This subtext permeated into everything, my own life included. You see, it, the media taught us what belonged to whom and what could be done by whom. It showed me that many of my personal likes, I grew up loving rock music, I liked uh, extreme sports, and I spoke mostly in English. So I quickly gained titles such as coconut, brown on the outside, white on the inside. The media reinforced this idea. And what it had effectively done was rob me of my own agency by negating my identity. Of course, I did not know this. I was young. I flew off to the land I'd always wanted to go to learn what I always wanted to learn. Doing a Bachelor of Animation in Australia was one of the greatest experiences I had ever had. And it cemented my desire to come back and make sure that everybody else who wanted to do the crazy things I wanted to do could do them and work for me. <laughs> I decided I would come back and be the Marvel Comics of Africa. And I came back with verve, with eagerness. I started working on two titles, one old, one new. The first was The Gift a story of a young boy who had just come back from overseas like I had just done and was learning to, how to deal with Zimbabwe and how to adapt their abilities within Zim. The main character of this was Terry Highgate, and you can guess what he looked like. This is me. Either way, 
I don't know when it happened. Somewhere within production, somewhere amongst all the flurries that was happening in Zimbabwe, but I kind of woke up. I don't know if it was the 100% local content that was mandated. <laughs> I don't know if it was the uh, plethora of Nigerian movies on our marketplace. I don't know if it was my church who taught me to change the way I think and renew my mind. Maybe it was working in advertising and getting increasingly frustrated at the number of international companies that just copy and pasted the advert from the UK here in Harare. The same lady on the Lux advert there was the lady here in Harare, not even considering that the new message they were saying was that if you use this soap, you might just never possibly achieve this Western beauty standard. Somewhere in all of that, I asked myself, why? My stories reflected my heart, but not my identity. It was like I ate the red pill and I saw it everywhere. It wasn't just me and it wasn't just comic books. It was the nation and it was all of media. It wasn't enough for me to just give kids characters that they could look up to. I had to give them characters that they could literally become. As long as they could look at stuff and subconsciously deep within themselves, know that that does not literally fit me, they would always fight within themselves against their own agency. I redid Titan God. I redid Captain Wolf. I redid The Gift. This time, he was called Maxwell Musonza. <laughs> he was not flying in from overseas. He was coming from Gweru to Harare. <laughs> I also looked at my all-time favorite, Captain Wolf. Remember I said I'd come back to it? You see, growing up, all the characters, he's a dog. The only way you could tell was the shape of his head and his nose. And growing up, I'd always seen characters, when they're depicted as animals, the skin part was always a certain color. Unbeknownst to me, I had just done that in my own media, and my favorite character was other from me. I renamed him Gundog, and I, gave, and I unabashedly used the brown crayon. <laughs> Soon after that, I published the double issue, and it went nationwide. It was hard to publish in Zim back in those days. Comics had been off the shelves for about eight years, and it was difficult convincing people to take these materials. After trying hard to solo distribute, we gave up and handed over to Man Marketing a good 2,700 copies that they sent around the country. Eventually, feedback came, both then and later, from people who read them when they were young. They would say it was amazing seeing places they knew, people they could recognize, experiences that were part of their lives, and brands that they themselves wore. It sparked something in them, and it told me that it wasn't really that we, the Africans, didn't like their own narrative. It was that we ourselves were not giving it to them. It became apparent that the rest of the guys around me weren't quite on this bandwagon. So I decided I needed to revitalize what I thought could become the Zimbabwe digital arts industry. Began to look around to try and find a way to build this industry and give artists an opportunity to create here and live their dreams here as well. I met a great friend of mine, my friend Eugene, and we co-founded the Zim Comic Con with the objective to create local, for local, but open to the world. Thank you. Seven years on, we have had five events, six mini events, we've had, or we still have a YouTube show, and we've got a plethora of media appearances. Many young artists and creators within our industry have grown to start creating their own works and their own devices and consistently publish, making heroes that even I would never have thought of. I continued to create as well. My own mission to challenge the omnicultural narrative, so pervasive in our media. I renamed Gun dog, Ganyamuto. <laughs> Shana for ferocious dog. Makes more sense, yeah? yeah? I also created a new team called Mare with a new leader, 
His name is Gamba Nika. Because we don't have captains here. His whole mandate was, they will learn to say my name the same way we have learned to say their supers and their captains. I would go on to challenge and wonder about why in space they only speak English. Or why when we want to share our own languages, we are told to learn theirs. Even though language is known as one of the greatest vehicles for culture and identity. So eventually, my characters began to look like me. <laughs> and to finish off, the African kids, in particular, black kids, can look ahead through the lens of imaginative media and speculative fiction and see themselves as part of the future. As long as they can see themselves as part of the future, they can build for it. And it gives them agency to create towards it. Gamba Nika may teach our future president how to be a hero when she's in grade seven. Who knows? But as long as we consciously deconstruct our media and place ourselves where we should be, with truth in our narratives, we'll give the right to future generations to give the world what it needs, Africa. Thank you.